want to be free, to be on the move, to go for a hike or whatever you like to do. Okay, so welcome back to Dream Sounds. Um, this is part two of an interview we're doing with Greg Meter, who is a sound designer who worked extensively with WDI in the 80s and 90s on um, things such as Epcot Center, um, Splash Mountain, Pirates of the Caribbean, The Phantom Manor, and a lot of work at Disneyland Paris. And so we just had a really interesting conversation um, relating to dark rides and sound design. And the second half of this interview, we're going to ask, um, I'm going to ask Greg some questions um, related to his other work as well. And so to start off, we're going to we have some questions that are related to Disney. What are some examples of sounds from Disney projects that you had trouble capturing and recording or if there were any concepts that were difficult to translate to recording? And were there any that didn't make the final cut that you wish had in a project? Um <clears throat> I not nothing comes to mind as far as not something not making it. Um I, mm-hmm. I sort of touched on this in the first on part 1 with Tower of Terror. Um, you know, I, I went to the Disneyland hotel and recorded a whole bunch of, I thought, cool elevator sounds and kitchen sounds and all sorts of things that I thought would really work. And then when I got into the studio and started playing them, they just didn't feel right. So Mm -hmm. they were cool sounds, but, um, they just didn't, they didn't translate well. So I ended up, you know, most of tower and, and, and for the record on tower, I did the, um, you know, I didn't do the background music up front. I did the cue line and the, the ascent and drop shafts. Uh, Joe Harrington actually did the fifth dimension. So that was Joe's. Mm-hmm. So I, as cool as that is, and as much as I'd like to take credit for the fifth dimension, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> but um, anyway, on the other stuff, I, the stuff that I recorded at the hotel, just it just didn't work right. Um, a couple things did. So, uh, but other than that, I, I, had to, I didn't have to abandon it, but I just had to go to the library and, and again, go to some actual physical props that Jimmy McDonald had built to, to get what I wanted. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of outboard gear and processing and things to make it sound ghostly and old. <clears throat> so, and I'm trying to think on anything else, you know, really nothing else because a lot of the sound design and on some of the attractions I worked on, I was, I was the supervising and, and the mixer, supervising editor and mixer. So mm-hmm. I didn't actually create some of the sounds. Um, Joe Harrington would do a lot of that and he would just give me the, literally the tape with the sounds on it. Um, oh, okay. So. It, it would just it depended on the project, <clears throat> um, you know. It just it, it really just depended on what the project was and what everybody's schedule was. Because many times Joe would do something, and there are other times he goes, "I don't have time. Can you do it?" And I would do it. And so, but I can't I can't think of anything specifically where something didn't work, other than the um, the Disneyland Hotel elevator sounds that sounded very cool, but just didn't feel right for Tower. Just mm-hmm. didn't have the right. They sounded too like real world. They didn't sound mm-hmm. even after doing all my, you know, my processing tricks to make it sound old and ghostly. It didn't. So, mm-hmm. and that's the that's the thing with sound design. A lot of times, you find out a lot of the sounds you end up using are have nothing to do with the real thing you're looking at. That's because so interesting. the The real sound just doesn't have any. Um, it just doesn't work. I mean, it's the real mm-hmm. sound, but it doesn't sound right. <laughs> it's it's and it's in in like and I I've worked in feature films for about five years and it's the whole thing of like <clears throat> do you want it to sound like a gunshot or do you want it to sound like a Hollywood gunshot mm-hmm. and you know it's just a real gunshot has n- no doesn't sound anything like what you hear in the movies generally so it's the same with all other sounds too mm-hmm. the real sound is way less dramatic than what you are expecting to hear mm-hmm. so maybe that's a long winded answer but. <laughs> No, I don't remember anything crazily not working. <laughs> well, I th- I think I'll use that answer as a segue into a question, an unrelated question to Disney, because you have extensive spe- experience as a sound designer in video games, and um, I find this interesting in particular because I think games can be thought of in a similar fashion to Dark Rides in the sense that the sound you're <laughs> working with is non-linear in a way, and so, and especially like in video games, you have more, I guess or it seems like you have more artistic liberty with creating sounds um, in a similar way to cartoons. And so would you say would you say that there are any differences or similarities between your work with different mediums like that? And do you find 
your experience working in physical spaces affecting digital ones or vice versa? Um, my answer is that <clears throat> when you do audio production like sound design and that kind of stuff, that process is the same no matter what the playback medium is. Mm -hmm. If the playback medium is a film, a television show, a video game, or a theme park ride, <clears throat> that's what the playback medium is. But the process to create the sound for that playback medium is always the same. Mm -hmm. You know, Foley is Foley. Um, sound effects are sound effects. Music is music. <clears throat> it's just the uh, what you have to do to it to make it play back. Like for for you know for film, you go into a dubbing stage and you mix it into six one or five one seven point one. Um, IMAX like 6.0 or you know Dolby Atmos um, that kind of stuff with video games you go through middleware like FMOD or WISE and you do things in there to make it sound what it needs to sound like um, and for theme parks you know you go into um, you just you're playing back multi sounds you know like hundreds of sounds in the same space um, so it's really the, the differences come on the side of how you how you present it not how you create it the creative mm -hmm. side is always the same um mm -hmm. what i've always found interesting was that when you work on like on a movie or a cartoon you know as a listener you're stationary and the sound moves around you in, in the form of a picture and sound when you go into a uh a, a, a theme park ride the sound is stationary and you as a listener move through it mm -hmm. uh, and then when you go into a video game <laughs> you get the best of both worlds you move through the sound and the sound moves around you Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, with AI going on, you never know what's going to happen next. So if, and from my standpoint or my experience, designing for video games is more complex than theme park or movies mm -hmm. because of the just so many unknowns. You know, with a movie, you see what you see. In a theme park, you see what you see. Um, you have some extraneous things like we talked about, like machine noise and crowd noises. But it basically, when you see an animatronic figure, you know you're going to hear a sound from it. Um, but in a video game, there might be one creature, there might be five creatures, there might be two machines or like just like one of the games I worked on had a lot of uh, generators and drone like signs sitting around that were just making sounds. But you never knew how many there were going to be. So you, when you designed it, you had to just be aware that there could be five or six of these things in one scene or not seen, but in a game of one zone. So anyway, it was very um, – the process – the design process was is consistent. The um, – you know, the, like the print mastering and the, or the, for the final playback medium is always is different. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered your question, but no, it did. Cause I, I think, I think that's so, I think that's particularly interesting. Cause, um, when I was referring to your video game work, I was referring to, um, wild star, um, which I saw, yeah, I yeah. saw videos of the sounds and everything. And I was, um, I don't know. I think the way you phrased it about sound being solitary and the way you move through it or, sit or are stationary in front of it says a lot about the way we interact with sound in general well um, yeah i always like at least like with video games you always try to think of it like you know if i walk out of my front door here you know what do i hear and as i move if i walk down the sidewalk down the street you know i'm going to hear the sounds change to my hearing in a certain way so at least with video games since you're generally walking or moving through areas i kind of like try to think of it in the same way mm -hmm. um it's just, you know, it's a lot of work to make something sound natural in a video game. Yeah, I can you imagine. Know, like, <laughs> you know, there's just so many things like levels and placement and panning and 3D uh, placement. And there's just a lot of things you can do to tweak the sound. And again, it's it's all very subjective. Like, mm -hmm. what do I want to hear? What does the game director want to hear? Uh, you know, there's it, 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 anything. It's always a collaborative experience. And like with Disney, the same thing. And, I, and I've always said this no matter what I've worked on is that when you're working on a project, <clears throat> when you're sitting in your edit suite with your computer and your monitor and your keyboards or whatever you're using, it's your sound. Mm -hmm. Once that door opens and, you know, you invite people in to listen to it, it becomes everyone's sound. Mm -hmm. And you have to, it's, you have to kind of like, you know, become a non-owner at that point. Like you own it while you're working on it. But then when you go to mix and, and install or put in a video game or whatever, you, it's a collaborative thing. And then at that point, it's not your sound anymore. It's everybody's sound. So mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. and, do you, and that, you know, that's, that's a hard thing to adjust to sometimes because you get, you fall in love with what you've just done. You think it's the most amazing thing you've ever done. <laughs> and then somebody goes, well, what else you got? Mm -hmm. so. do, you, do you think you, you said that, um, 
the the way the the process behind working with the sound um, doesn't is isn't really changed by the way it's presented. But do you find that um, I guess in a video game you have the players have more opportunity to be less passive about the way they interact with sounds and they can interact with the sound multiple times. And do you find that that changes the way the sound is worked with as opposed to a ride or a movie where it's you're able to control the way you present it and it leaves it I feel like the sound could be left more vulnerable if it's isolated from the action um yeah I'm trying to think how to answer that exactly um I know that like in this in respect to video games especially when you're creating sound you're always thinking in terms of at least with me, like, what is the player going to hear? Mm-hmm. Um, because kind of like what you said, because they're going to experience things unique to them, unique to that player in the game. You know, with a film, you can just kind of bash people over the head with the sound and say, yeah. here, it's an explosion, boom, it's an explosion. But in a game, again, it's an explosion, but you might, you know, that explosion may not is not the only thing happening at the time. And so you're always thinking, okay, if the player's doing this, or if I were standing there in real life, what would I be hearing? Would I be hearing that explosion or am I hearing the generator off to the right or am I hearing the creature coming up behind me going to, you know, kill me? So I don't know. I don't know that I get how deep I get into it. I just think like, at least from a video game standpoint, I'm always, I think I, I find myself tend to thinking more from a player perspective. Mm-hmm. Whereas like with theme park and even in movies and stuff, it's more of just a sound perspective. Like, yeah, I'm going to make it sound like this and everybody's going to love it. Mm-hmm. That's very that's that's still very helpful though. Um, and that, yeah, that answers my question perfectly because I that's just so interesting to me that dynamic because I think we always um, in our modern world a lot of us associate sound as a passive exercise and listening as something that just happens and you pay attention. But video games introduces that dynamic of the user being able to control the experience in a way that isn't as available in like film or the, even theme park rides. So that's really uh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm still sometimes I'll talk to people and and I'll say did you hear that and they'll go, I'll go they'll go hear what and I'll say like a bird or something and they'll go wow you can hear that and it's like well you can hear it too you just have to listen for it mm-hmm. but a, a lot of people that don't do sound don't listen for things I mean they hear stuff but they're not listening and and that's like like critical listening yeah so and it's not a bad thing it's just it's just a, if, as you work in sound for years and years you just develop that sixth sense of of listening to things. Mm-hmm. Not just hearing it, but listening. So it's just, I've always found that interesting how I'll hear things and some people say, I didn't hear that. It's like, well, you did hear it. You just didn't listen to it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't mean to be in a bad way. It's just I just always find that interesting with people that are like what I call not sound people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I. Yeah. No, I agree. And I think I think. um I just think there are so many ways that you can listen to things as well and on different levels that you can listen to things that it's that it's interesting to explain that to somebody. And for anyone who's listening who is not familiar um, with these types of questions, I'm going to include an essay, a link to an essay um, or to information on Paulina Oliveros and her um, her philosophy of deep listening and kind of what that means, because I think that's definitely relevant to what we're talking about. Um, well, yeah, because that, that comes back to like when you're mixing music. Yeah, you know, you'll 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 focus in on an instrument, and you're mm-hmm. just focused in on that instrument, and you know you get that thing sounding great, and then you mix it, and then you come back the next day and listen to it, and you're thinking either you hear way too much of it or not enough, and you have to sit back and listen to the whole presentation, like the whole arrangement, mm-hmm. and that's where you know that's where like it's it's interesting because like you were just talking about deep listening, like if you listen to like for me like a classical music track. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's so many instruments and you can just focus in like on the woodwinds or the oboe or whatever and just listen to that part and mm-hmm. it's you know it's amazing but then you, you step back and listen to the whole thing and it's all it's a different experience mm-hmm. so i don't know it's just my personal my personal listening <laughs> i listen to music I, I have two ways of listening I, ha- I can listen to just instruments or just things or just you know let's just listen to the overall mix mm-hmm which I think is the way it was probably intended. Just, you know, it was mixed. You hear the whole music piece and you go, yeah, it sounds good. I like it. Mm -hmm. Do you know who did the arrangements for the Disney World version of Splash Mountain? Oh, the music? Yeah, like the arrangement is just so different than the Disneyland one for Frontierland. um, Yes, I do. John, you know, John Debney did the arrangements for for California. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a 
you know, John is, you know, big history with Disney and now he's, you know, big time film composer guy. Yeah. Um, so he did that. So, um, the arrangements for, we recorded the music for Florida in Nashville with a bunch of session mm-hmm. guys. And these were just, these guys, they, to be honest, they did, they did the arrangements of the music. They, uh, I mean, for the, for the attraction music, because we were using the singing from Disneyland, we had to we had to record in the key that the singer sang it in. And you know probably better than I, the keys for orchestral instruments and the keys for um, banjo are not always the best. You know, mm-hmm. what sounds good and what what sounds good on the banjo doesn't necessarily work well for a violin player. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, what happened was um, for the attraction music, they had to play to a click and in the right key, and you know they did very well with it. But they they all admitted that this wasn't the best sounding key for these instruments. Uh, so the arrangements they did were basically they sat around, they listened to it, and you know you know chord progressions like one four five or three or six that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. They literally just had a, a, a yellow piece of paper, the pencil and said, okay, we'll do one four, we'll do one, then we'll do five, and Bobby, you take six, got a little solo, then I'll come back to two, then we'll go to three, and then back to one, and Billy, you take one, mm-hmm. and that was that was how it was done. Oh, that's so great! Because I feel like, just, yeah, they just played it. Wow. Yeah. Well, the the arrangements for the Florida version. I mean, I love. I feel like they're so different. I love them both so much, um, Disneyland and Florida. But it's just so lively, the Florida version, and that and that totally makes sense then. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was literally the. I don't know how many. You know, we were there for two weeks in Nashville recording. So every day there was a kind of a. It wasn't always the same guys. It was the same core. But there would be four, mm-hmm. five, six guys sitting around a circle, you know, just sitting, you know, just like you'd picture, just sitting in a circle with their banjos and their guitars, just playing, mm-hmm. you know, looking at each other, just kind of chuckling and playing and having a good time. It wasn't a, you know, it was a very, it was a very, what I call a very Nashville session. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they <laughs> joke and it, they were just, you know, they, all these guys got along, you know, they're all amazing players. And, you know, from my viewpoint, it was a very fun, it was a very fun recording session time because everybody mm-hmm. was relaxed and, you know, they just all had fun with it. Mm-hmm. You know, and then when we went to the background music, all the background music you hear, like in the queue lines and in the restaurants and, you know, the gift shops and stuff, that was the same guys. It's just, they just, at that point, they had no click and they put it in a key they liked. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> and literally, literally they would just talk out the chord, you know, the chord movements and just play it. Mm-hmm. And just look at each other, like, you know, give a nod to the banjo guy, and he would play a solo, and then they'd give a nod to the guitar guy, and he'd play a solo, and then they all look at each other, and they would stop. So it was, <laughs> it was very, very, um, it wasn't unorganized, but it wasn't very formal. Mm-hmm. But they were all good. Well, I guess the idiom that that music takes from at the root is just folk music, American folk music. So that makes sense that that would yeah, lend itself that, so know, well. And that, all that, you know, I, I I wasn't involved with that decision at all. I, I liked that decision, but that was a decision that was made, I don't, you know, by the creative guys and, well, Kathy, the show producer. So mm-hmm. they, you know, they made their decisions at some point. And, you know, I, I think they were, that was a great decision, but um, it was nothing that audio and myself were involved in. Yeah. Well, st- we were well, involved in recording it, but not deciding to record it. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that story, though. That's super fascinating. Um, yeah, the other <laughs> quick, quick. Oh yeah, on, yeah. No, go ahead. You know, because, <laughs> because the music, you know, the um, oh, laughing. I think it's laughing place. Yeah. There's a harmonica that plays in the laughing place, mm-hmm. and as you know, harmonicas are only only have a certain range in a certain key. Yeah. And if you want to play in a different key, you have to use a different harmonica. Mm-hmm. Well, because Debney arranges for orchestra, this thing was changing key every two bars or every you know four bars. It was changing keys a lot. <laughs> and the guy Charlie, the, uh, the harmonica player, started playing it, and just you know he could only get through two bars or so before he had to stop, and we just had to punch in and pick up the next part. So <laughs> when you hear the harmonica playing, I think it's Laughing Place in Florida, that was multiple multiple takes because no one harmonica can play that whole song the way it's written. <laughs> oh, that's so great! <laughs> he just he had a you know he had his music stand out with about five or six different harmonicas, and he would play one, stop, we'd back up punch in he'd play the next part back up punch in and go forth so not that it'll ever happen but you'll never hear that song played live on a harmonica mm-hmm. <laughs> so i don't know that was always as a as me as a you know a musician slash sound designer that was always interesting mm-hmm. yeah i mean these are these are the types of things that i just love hearing so thank you for sharing that um 
Yeah, my, ne- my next question is related to, you mentioned earlier, you talked about Golden Dreams in part one. Um, and I can't remember if you mentioned that in part one, but I also heard that you, you played drums on the re-recording of that. Um, I, or, I played, um, yeah, I played uh, the Kennedy funeral drum sequence. Yes. Not the, I didn't play the drum set part. That was oh, the yes. session guy. I played mm-hmm. the, uh, there's a part when, um, you know, they show the, the Kennedy funeral sequence. Mm-hmm. And so there's a drum kind of a cadence playing in the background and I, I played that mm-hmm. but you know that came about too again just sort of happenstance um, George Wilkins wrote that you know he didn't write the original piece that was Bob Moline mm-hmm. but George wrote the arrangement for the redo you know with the choir and stuff so we're in the studio and we're mixing it and we get to this one spot in the film and they sh- you know you see the funeral sequence and George just looks at me and he goes man I forgot to write a snare part <laughs> Because you know, he just—it's just a little part. He, you know, he just forgot to write it. So I said, "Well, you know, I can play it. Just write it, and I'll play it." So that's what he did. He wrote a part. I brought a drum in, and we just played it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's—I believe it's still there. So that's my one—one mm-hmm. one of my lasting things. <laughs> I, <laughs> but I'm that, just finding a lot of the old stuff I worked on is slowly being replaced and phased out. Which you know, it's going to happen. But um, mm-hmm. I still have a few things around like that. What do you, but that wasn't, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that wasn't the first time that you were a percussionist at Epcot, though. Um, in, oh, no. Because you no, were there I, when you first started. You, you, you were a live musician, correct? Correct. Yeah, well, my very first percussion job was playing in the Disneyland Fantasy on Parade Christmas Parade. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So, because <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, I live, I, I basically grew up in Southern California. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. With the exception of some time in Florida and Denver. But anyway. Yeah, so I started at Disneyland, but um, that was all part-time seasonal work. But right in around about 1983, I got a call saying, if you're interested in being in a band full-time in Florida, we got a job for you. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'd been playing at Disney, so they were aware of me, and I, you know, paperwork was all taken care of, and they knew I could play things. So mm-hmm. I went down there, and I played in the Future World Brass. Oh, that's Epcot, awesome. Which, you know, if in in entertainment terms there was two groups there was the white band and the blue band mm-hmm. and the blue band was drum the drum the future core which was drum and bugle core and myself having been in drum and bugle core the last thing you want to be is called a band mm-hmm. <laughs> so by calling them a blue band i'm sure it didn't sit well with them but that's just what they were called <laughs> um, and we were the white band and cause mm-hmm. we were all white so so yeah so i played from 1983 to 1987 uh, oh, Every day, just doing seven sets a day, except for rehearsal days. Um, and we'd play casuals. We'd play um, stuff over at the Contemporary, uh, different conventions at the hotels, um, Disney conventions. We would just kind of be like atmosphere music. Mm-hmm. So, And we would fill in over at Magic Kingdom sometimes at the Easter Parade, um, the Christmas Parade. We played for the opening of the Living Seas Pavilion. Um, just a lot of different things. Oh, that's so amazing. Uh, and I guess that... Yeah. That what you just said answers my second part of that question, which was what was the repertoire or your experience with that? Because I think, well, you know, yeah, the repertoire was a lot of <laughs> how many arrangements of Zippity Doodah can you play? <laughs> <laughs> now it wasn't quite that bad, but we had three or four different Disney medleys, um, mm-hmm. and we were in essence, as as the future of brass, we were in essence a marching big band. Yeah. So I mean, we didn't have woodwinds, we didn't have saxophones, but we had. Uh, trumpets trombones and tubas and then three drummers who were we were told to play like a drum set so we would march out simply because we had to get out there but once we were there we tried to play it like big band Mm -hmm. and i I think we succeeded um so we would play a lot of stuff we played like glenn miller medley um we'd play um i don't know i'm just thinking of tunes we played Uh, we played some huey lewis stuff hip to be square you know hits hits of the 80s Mm -hmm. (laughs) um (laughs) Some uh, Pointer Sisters things, uh, Glenn Miller medleys, uh, just, you know, stuff that people recognized that they would like to hear for 10 minutes while they're waiting out there for, you know, other things. Mm-hmm. So that was our repertoire, just kind of general stuff that familiar tunes that people knew. And we'd throw in a couple pop tunes, but they were, you know, pop tunes arranged for a brass band. So, but they sounded pretty good. And we played a lot of Chicago because that was, mm-hmm. a, you know, horn band. So we played a lot of Chicago stuff. Um, and just you know that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. That's great. Were those were those all? Um, do you know if Disney if that was like a pool of licensed songs that that you, you could know, pull from? Well, the arrangements were done. I mean, Disney had an arrangers, you know, some arrangers on staff. Um, yeah, that did a lot of it. 
But in our band, you know, a lot of our guys would do our own arrangements. You know, one of the horn trumpet players would write a write a, a tune, or not write the tune, but write the arrangement, mm-hmm. submit it to the company, they get paid for it, and then it would go into you know the Disney repertoire, and any band could then play it. Mm-hmm. Um, but because it was written for our band specifically, it was hard for other bands to play it. So, um, but and I don't know about licensing. From what I understand, and this is just third hand information that I heard was that because Disney played so many tunes back then, you know, with ASCAP and BMI, they didn't really have a way to uh, pay for individual tunes. Mm -hmm. So they would just give like a blanket fee to ASCAP, like a million dollars and say, here, here's a million dollars. We're going to play a lot of your stuff. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't know that for sure, but that's what I heard on multiple, I heard it from different people. So Mm -hmm. I believe there's some truth to it. But yeah, Mm -hmm. so with ASCAP and BMI, the um, licensing fee was just paid to cover the year Mm -hmm. and like, Within that year, you could play anything that ASCAP or BMI was, I guess, representing or had. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> that's how I think it worked, but I don't, I don't know for sure. Okay, well, that's super. That's still super useful to know. I mean, I, I mean, I never went to the original Epcot Center, but that original album from 1982 is my favorite Disney music hands down ever. Um, well, yeah, the origin that original music was all licensed. I mean, that was all written specifically for the park. Oh, for yeah. Disney. So that was, yeah. you know, that I'm sure it's covered under ASCAP or BMI, but you know, that's a if you want to copy that stuff, you're going to run into the the Disney lawyers at some point. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. Um, but it's just so <laughs> mysterious, I think the music of early Epcot, and so it's interesting to hear Glenn Miller medleys and <laughs> well Chicago. that was because we were a live unit you know yeah the, um, the pre-recorded music that was playing in the park was that it was that custom stuff and i you know yeah. for the record i love that music too and um you know making the <clears throat> in the early days you'd have to make show tapes which because the early days the audio would play off analog tape yeah analog tape would wear out so every few months you'd have to replace that tape and you'd have to make new tapes so making the new tapes i, I that was one of my first jobs at wdi was making these show tapes so I would just hear that music every day and it was just amazing music. I loved it. Oh yeah. Some of the, I mean, yeah, I, some of the best melodies I think for theme parks ever were the original Epcot. Like it's fun to be free. Um, the universe of energy, all, all that yeah, original yeah. lineup was just incredible. Yeah. It, you know, I even liked some of the music from magic journeys. <laughs> yes. Which, magic journeys, surprisingly psychedelic for a Disney soundtrack. <laughs> well, And, you know, and for like Sherman brothers. Too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, they were, you know, they were, they were, you know, they could, they could do it like that when they needed to. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was very Jefferson airplane for Epcot center. <laughs> well, you know, I, I always say this, the Sherman brothers were young once too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, they, you know, they listened to what they listened to when they were younger. And, uh, you know, there was, um, they wrote some, they wrote some interesting things. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Especially for stuff like, like Magic Journeys and stuff. Yeah. Um, so we have, we have two more questions. Uh-huh. Um, the, my next question is, what is it like um, working on a Circle Vision project? Because I, like I mentioned to you before, I live in Berlin. And so to read that you did work on the Berlin Symphony film, um, especially at a place like Sony Center, which is like 10 minutes from my apartment is wild. Um, but Circle yeah, Vision yeah, feels like yeah. such a different medium according to like film and other, and just theme parks in general. Is that, do you think about that differently or what does that entail? Well, kind of going back to what I'd said earlier, the, the, the production or post-production process with audio is all the same. The mixing is where it gets mm-hmm. really different and weird for Circle Vision. Yeah. Um, because in addition to... Uh, you know, the one I did over there for, um, at the Berlin, the Sony center. I also did a circle vision film for, um, Volkswagen up at Wolfsburg at mm-hmm. their, you know, they have their main manufacturing plant in Wolfsburg. And, um, I did a big circle vision film up there as well. And so it, the, the production part, creating of the sounds, the sound design, that's all the same. Um, but the hardest part with circle vision is just, it's the listening position because you're never going to hear stuff the same in any one. You know, if you're in two different spots in a in a theater, it's going to sound different. And with circle vision, sound bounces off the screens in weird, odd ways. So, you know, think of a sound coming off the. You know, there's not a left screen. There's nine screens generally on a circle vision setup. Mm-hmm. And it'll come. You'll be standing at one point. The sound will come off one speaker, hit a screen, and it will sound like it's coming from screen two, even though the sound is actually coming from screen nine where the picture is, but you're standing over in an area where it's bouncing off screen two. And there's really no way around that because it's, it's, uh, I mean, 
there is kind of with you can get speakers now that ha- you can go really high end and get these directional speakers that can really control the directionality of the sound. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you go that route, you can kind of control better how things sound. But the, the Sony Center or the yeah the Sony Center there, um, Berlin Symphony and the uh, Wolfsburg, the Secret of Safety film, <clears throat> they was just standard you know theater speakers. So mm-hmm. you basically picked a spot in the theater where it was called the listening position, and for me it was the center of the theater. And mm-hmm. you were you worked to that spot. So all your panning, all your your levels, everything was to that spot. So kind of like a, I, I sort of look at it like a picture coming into focus in a circle vision theater. When you walk in, if the if the soundtrack is playing and you walk in, it's not going to sound right until you get right in that listening position, which is generally the center of the theater. Mm-hmm. Because no matter where you stand, you're going to get weird reflections and weird sounds and sounds coming from places that doesn't look like they should be coming from. But then when you walk right in the middle, it all comes into focus and then you can then it then sounds right. So all the considerations are on the mixing side with that. Mm-hmm. Um, the, I mean, the sound is the sound. Uh, you know, the thing with the music, though, is that you want to ideally get the music. And, you know, as a composer, when you when you talk with composers, you want to ha- not the composing part. The composing is you're still just writing notes. Mm-hmm. But when you do what's called the pre dub, when you mix the music you don't want to mix it down to three tracks or stereo because then you're stuck with that mix. You want to mix it into what are called stems. Like, you know, like you you'd kind of touched on earlier, you want to mix woodwinds together, maybe brass together, percussion together, different sections like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that way, when you get into the theater, you can have the ability to change the levels between sections because in a studio, it's a very controlled environment. Speakers are set up a certain way and everything sounds great. But you get into a, like a circle vision site, especially, and <clears throat> acoustically, it's just, it's a very strange space. So you want to have as many options open to you. So it's its all on the mixing side of just considerations. Mm-hmm. Um, if that answers your question, I hope. Yes, no, it does. It does. Um, thank you. I So for the last question, I want to ask you about Disneyland Paris, um, because it, the the Disneyland Park is um, in Paris is my favorite castle park for many reasons, but mostly just about the sheer detail that right. is throughout the park. I just love how much attention was paid to like theming, scenery, and sound as well. And I was wondering if you could, I don't know, if you have any stories you could share about the creation of that or your involvement with that park, whether whether related to Phantom Manor or not. Um, whatever you feel comfortable talking about, if you were to choose one story. Yeah, well, I have one one story that sticks out, and it's, it's not that funny. It's funny to mm-hmm. me, but um, you know, I, I worked on like Phantom Manor was my big ride. I also worked on Pirates. Um, I recorded the uh, Morse code that you hear at the train station for um, when oh, I super cool Frontier Line. That was that was all that was a new record. Um, mm-hmm. The uh, and also the um, oh, there's a I forget the name of the restaurant. It's just a it's a restaurant, but it has about a, it has about a one hour loop of like tack piano playing in the background. Is that the um the golden nugget? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It is. So anyway, I recorded that piano. Which oh. <laughs> there's no there's no there's no funny story about that other than the guy was really good. The guy that we hired to do it. Mm-hmm. So basically, we set the we set the microphones up, turned the tape machine on, and said go, and he just played for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and when we got done, we said thank you, and that was it. <laughs> so it's pretty much a one take shot. I mean, we I think we had to stop because you know what the tape the tapes were only thirty minutes, so we did have to stop at one point mm-hmm. and rewind and start on another set of tracks. But that was a you know basically one guy just playing the whole the whole time. And I I don't know that's that wasn't my my story was more on Phantom. Um, mm-hmm. This is not that great of a story, so I don't I don't really have any great stories from there, but. Mm-hmm. I had wor- I was working on Phantom. We were adjusting levels in the ride, and we'd done it. And we'd done it in the um, after you come out of the elevator section, and you're walking in the load hallway leading up to the ride vehicle load area. Um, there were some speakers up there, and they were sounding good, and we were happy with it. And then the next day, we came back, and they were very muffled, and we're like, "What is going on? We just we just did this yesterday." And we look up there; everything looked normal. So we get up there with a screwdriver and a ladder, and we take off the grill, and there was paper back in there behind the you know covering the speaker, and we're like, mm-hmm. like not just like piece of paper but like wadded up newspaper stuck in there and we, we were trying to figure out what it was we, we found a guy who was a painter and he goes oh we were painting there last night and we didn't want to spray paint the speakers so we put paper in there to protect it but we just never took the paper out so <laughs> that was just like you know 
during the construction phase and the installation phase of Disneyland Paris, that was going on all over the place because there were so mm-hmm. many different disciplines working. And everybody was a lot of, you know, painters were from Italy, um, welders are from Scotland. I mean, there's just, they're all from different places. So nobody was really communicating a lot of times. So that was kind of a, to me, that was a, as an audio story, that was funny. I don't know how funny it is to anybody else, but mm-hmm. it was just funny that there's paper in the speakers that wasn't there the day before. And the guy that put it there, you know, he just decided he, or I don't know if he decided, but he forgot to take it out. And so we were trying to think how many more things like this are happening that we don't know about. Um, so, but that was the only time that really happened. Other than that, you know, once we, once we adjusted our sound, it kind of stayed that way. So mm-hmm. that, I don't know, that's really kind of my only story. I don't really have any main stories from there. I was there for a month in uh, February before mm-hmm. opening in April. And it was a lot of just, you know, working, you just running around, putting sound in, trying to hear it. And then in between painters and construction workers and other things going on. So it was, Mm -hmm. you know, from a sound standpoint, it was never really an ideal situation because ideally you want the attraction to be done and almost ready to open. So you can ride through it as it like an open, but you know, like I said, there was still, there were paper in some of the speakers. You go to some rooms to mix and there's scaffolding set up in front of the speakers. And there's a guy in there with a, you know, um, a grinder grinding welds on something. And just, it was very, it was challenging. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. So, I didn't really, you know, it wasn't like unexpected. It's just, it's never, it was, but it wasn't the situation you'd hope for. But mm-hmm. that's the way most installations work anyway. It's always, you kind of have to go in with this open mind that whatever you think's going to happen isn't. <laughs> and it's, the environment is never going to be, I mean, rarely will it be exactly what you need mm-hmm. um, or what you're ex- expecting. So, yeah, unfortunately, I don't really have any big, um, you know, Disneyland Paris stories. Oh no worries at all. That um, that like that was awesome. Even just to hear the story about the tack piano. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, my only, <laughs> I did buy a ham sandwich on property once from a trailer, and I gave her like a, a giant bill because I wasn't sure of the French currency. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she gave me change, like for a, I, I gave her like a hundred, and she gave me change from a twenty, and I wasn't sure how to ask for the change back, so I ended up having a really expensive ham sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> because I just, I mean, I, I didn't speak French. I, you know, I, I understood words, but mm-hmm. I didn't, you know, I was only over there for a month. So a lot of the people that relocated over there for two years did take French classes so they could, and, you know, they didn't speak fluent French, but they could converse. Mm-hmm. Whereas I just kind of came in and did my thing. So I didn't really do a lot of French at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, so I ended up overpaying for a lot of things because I didn't know how to ask for change. <laughs> um, I... But that's really not a... Disney that's just a you know something that happened not a big Disney story no I empathize that was I uh, yeah that was all, when I first moved to Germany I was the same way where I would avoid confrontation and <laughs> yeah yeah well I you know when I went and I did the Wolfsburg project in Germany mm-hmm. I was there for um like six weeks and uh I won't say that I speak German but I could at least walk down the hall and knew the conversations what they were about mm-hmm yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of nice. I didn't speak it, but I was able to, you know, pick up enough words to know that they weren't talking about me <laughs> and and my mix. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, well, yeah. Thank you yeah. so much for doing this. Like I was saying, um, like I was saying when, before we started recording. I mean, I this niche of um, entertainment, sound design, and specifically in theme parks and dark rides is just such an important thing I think and I think the work you've done and the rides you've worked on are just examples of the pinnacle of that art form so thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and answer these questions sure yeah it's fun it's fun reliving you know the old memories and just I forget sometimes how many things I've worked on yeah (laughs) I can imagine yeah I mean yeah thank you so much yeah Yeah, and I'm sure everyone listening um if you want to learn more about Greg Meter, I'll put more stuff in the description. And yeah, this has been so enlightening. So thank you so much. Sure, no problem. Thanks. Thanks.